Okay, thank you very much. It's a real pleasure and honor to be here. And I'm very happy to follow up with a description of what I would say is an example of some application of this system thinking where we've been putting it in action with Millennium Institute. So do I need to press this to start the slide? Yes. I want to talk about the Echo Saken V challenges and systems we need to put into action because we need to take account of a fairly broad range of view for a lot of our policies at a national and global level. And first, very, very briefly introducing the Millennium Institute, which was founded 30 years ago by Jerry Barney, who'd written the Global 2000 Report under President Carter that raised a number of issues of achieving sustainable use of resources. Then President Reagan came in, and because of the polarization, this all went out the door. But countries around the world had read this report, and several invited Jerry to come and talk to them. And he realized that there was a broad basis for promoting this. He founded the Millennium Institute with a vision of reducing poverty and increasing sustainable growth while improving living standards in countries around the world, and accepted the mission was to find ways of doing this to develop appropriate strategies and provide the tool which he developed in the Threshold 21 model to help countries make these kinds of decisions. So this is a very brief view of where we've been operating in countries around the world, helping them develop better strategies from very big countries to very small countries. So we have a fair amount of experience. Myself, just a very brief introduction, um, I started in basic economics and got my PhD at MIT, caught, and I worked at the World Bank for a long term. And there I did a lot of work modeling and I learned the strengths of conventional modeling, but the weaknesses of not taking account of many externalities, of being based as much on real theory as what was really going on in the world. And it was very important to take account of real world relations because going out to developing countries, I learned a lot about what was actually happening there. And they weren't perfect markets or things like that. They had many other things. And I also learned how valuable it was to bring stakeholders together and get them to work. And where I could bring ministries together in countries to cooperate, they could do much better projects than just going down their own little narrow paths. Um, but that wasn't something the World Bank was always actively promoting. Um, when I retired from the World Bank, um, I moved up to take a more serious account of Echo Sokin V, the relations of the environment and stuff, partly because my wife had been very involved in environmental issues and convinced me we had to take a much broader view of the uh, environmental impacts. And I discovered in this process about system dynamics and the Threshold 21 model. And it became very clear to me that this was a very valuable integrated approach that took account, and I'll describe it briefly in a moment, how the various economic, social, environmental factors linked together and that it would help produce sustainable strategies and part of that very much was being able, as a tool, to bring various policymakers together to learn how to cooperate. Now, here's a very basic view of the structure of the model. Um, if I give a presentation tomorrow in one of the open space sessions, I'll get into it in much more detail. Um, but <clears throat> you can see that part of it is based on the um, polarity of the economy and society's relations, the society and the environment's relations and the environment and the economy relations. They all depend on energy to do anything, but it really shows how to do that. But we get a little bit beyond this into multiplicity in our relationships. And you can see here briefly how things get connected. Everything connects to everything else in the various sectors. Now, that's just a rough, rough overview, and it's a little hard to see from where you're sitting, but we can look at it much more closely. But when you get down to the details of the model, you will see what would look like a huge bowl of spaghetti with everything linking to everything else. And we you know, have links in our basic models to about 2,000 variables, and some of our more complex ones get up to 10 or 12,000 variables and how they interact and relate. Um, and as I say, I can give you a more detailed presentation as we come up. But we really face a lot of very serious challenges for the echo system, ecological, and economic foundations. As you know, the world's population has expanded very rapidly, and I'll give you a brief picture of that. 
you can see what this is the world's population and how it's gone and how it stayed well below um, half a million until a few hundred years ago and now it's up to seven and going to nine. So this is a little example of exponential growth and you can imagine the pressure that puts on the world. Now we have also the globalization economically and socially so there's much more tight interconnection and what we see happening in little countries in the Middle East or things like that has impacts on the price of our gas at the car and things here. So there's much more tight interconnection. And of course, with this intense economic activity, we're using much more of our environmental resources, which poses a real challenge to sustainability. And our biosystems, as you know, are stressed. In fact, the studies of the global footprint, the total amount of pressure the world's population is putting on the environment, it is, to be sustainable, would require one and a half planets now. It passed one back in the 70s and is expected to get up to two if we don't make some serious changes. And then we're also being affected by climate change, whether it's our hurricanes and typhoons or other things. So there's a lot of challenges from the ecosystems that we need to address in order for our economies and societies to continue uh, providing the services that we need. I just showed you this population growth. So we really need to take more a systemic action and approach to deal with these interaction among these three main pillars. And we need to shift from exponential growth to more sustainable growth that will protect resources. Because as you know, with exponential growth, it keeps going bigger and bigger and bigger. And up to a point, that may be OK. But the planet is not getting bigger and bigger and bigger and producing more resources. So we have to be able to adjust our economic and social activity to fit within the source that, that will uh, support that and to protect these systems and uh, to get to really sustainable policies. And in fact, we did work with UNEP in the global, uh, the Green Economy Report that came out several years ago and use the model to show the kinds of shifts in policies, and not just policies and technology, but the way, uh, what I call the behavior changes of how we develop and design and conduct our activity that could shift back to a sustainable global footprint of one. But it requires some very, very major changes around the world, and we're now working with UNEP to translate this green approach from a global level where we don't make many global policies to a country level and below where we do make these kinds of policies. So we really need to start by identifying the issues to address. And that's where the causal diagrams and system dynamics is very useful because it is quite visible, these relationships, to normal people who are experts in the field but not detailed modelers and don't understand that. And to talk about positive and negative feedbacks and bringing these people together can also identify further research and cooperation that is needed. One example, we were working in Mozambique a number of years ago with support from the Carter Center and bringing together the various groups of people. And one of the things they wanted to include in their strategy was, well, if we build roads in rural areas, we'll enable farmers to reach markets and do better production and trade and things like that. So on a, you know, plural basis looking at agriculture and the uh, infrastructure, we incorporated that in our very broad Threshold 21 model and showed how after the roads were built in four years, there would be increased incomes in the areas where the roads were built, reducing poverty, improved incomes in urban areas because more trade going on and things like that. So we brought together a whole group of people and we're working with from various sectors and somebody says, hey, wait a minute, you build roads in Southern Africa you increase HIV infection. And we said, oh, we hadn't taken that into account. So we brought in, they had a study. Our modeler took it home that night, not home, to the hotel. And we came back the next day and showed the results and said, well, here are the benefits. Then you're still getting improved incomes and reduction in poverty, especially over the first five or 10 years. Not quite as high as we had shown before, because with HIV and over a longer term, you had increased mortality rates reductions in the productive labor force age groups and a number of other factors. So this enabled us to get a clearer picture of what was going on and brought people together and they decided not to stop building the roads, but to make sure the health department went out 
and introduce preventative measures and precautionary activities to reduce the implication of HIV AIDS. So this is how it brought people together and enable them to do mitigating policies. So we also get more cooperation among various stakeholders when we address critical issues and the synergies across these sectors. And we can help build a common ownership of using this tool. One case in Jamaica where we were working with the Planning Institute there and they were very keen on the model for Jamaica. And they thought the opposition party was gonna win the next election and they were afraid, oh, well, you know how partisan politics are. They were all gonna get booted out and the opposition party would group in. The head of the Planning Institute says, we gotta convince them to continue using the model. So we went down and had a very long meeting with the opposition leaders and we showed them the model and how it worked and their initial reaction is, oh well, this is just a crazy little toy that the current administration was using to prove all the nonsense it's trying to get out there. We wouldn't want to think about that. But we says, no, wait a minute. What are the key policy uh, changes you want to put in? And they gave us a list of six and we said, well, we've got three of them in the model. We'll show you what those policy changes will do. And we did, and we said, and we can incorporate the other in the model going forward. Oh, they said. So after about four hours, they said, okay, we're gonna keep using this model. So when they came into power, uh, they continued using the model, and in fact, the head of the Planning Institute became the permanent secretary of finance. So we can bring people together with this, and they can see how it will function well. So we also need to develop long-term policies. It's not just the short term or even the five-year term, because as you probably know, what's a mere second or two for the environment is a couple of generations for people. <laughs> and we don't think that far ahead, but a lot of the environmental changes, uh, unless you take precautionary action up front, you can't undo them down the road. And we need to compare positive and negative results across various sectors to build uh, cooperation, as was indicated earlier, the importance of cooperation. It's not either or, but we need to balance both of them and design greener policies. We're doing a lot of work on climate change. And in Namibia, and now I'll, I can only point to the one of them, yeah. Uh, what we do is the base run, and this is what the GDP would be if they continued their current policies and there was no climate change that occurred. The bottom line is what happens if you introduce what the likely effects of climate change are going to be. And then the line in the middle is, this is the climate change adaptation policies they were planning on putting in that would improve things a little bit. And then we did much more research with them and the model used the model to show what additional policy changes would get them roughly back up to the base case and what the impacts of that would be on things like population and everything else. So they could get a whole picture and put it together to develop that kind of stuff. So we also just have to make a lot more green changes to the economy to reduce climate change mitigation as well as adaptation and determining what these kind of mitigating actions would be. And if we get clear results, we can often inform decision makers to make the right decision once they see and understand what the causal relationships are and how they work. And an example here is in the US back in uh, 2006 and seven, we were able uh, to introduce our USA model, which had a lot of energy issues into it, at a presentation at the New America Foundation. And there are a number of staff from Congress there, and they says, hey, wait, this is interesting on the CAFE standard. We need to use this to explain it to other people to try to build more support. And the model was able to show, again, I'll have to be over here, this is what the uh, GDP, the lower one, would be under normal circumstances. And if they introduced the CAFE standard, the GDP would be going up. This is over a long term because it takes a while to have the shift in the whole automobile fleet to have more efficiency. And the important thing about the model, I can't go into the details here, I could go separately, is with the causal tracing, we could go back and say, the reason that happened is we reduced the imports of oil, which was important for the trade factor, and with people's cars being more efficient, they wouldn't drive more particularly, but when they pulled out of the gas station, they'd have more money in their pocket, and they would then be able to spend it on other domestic goods. 
and that increased demand for domestic production would cause GDP to go. Once, and we took account of there would be a slight loss of, of income in uh, the automobile, well, in the oil industry, not in the automobile industry, because they'd be selling roughly as many cars. They just have to make them a little bit cleaner. So we were able to show those things, and this helped convince people, hey, there's a real reason we can understand why this is going to be beneficial. And one of the other things, because we do longer term reductions, is we also included in this model putting in renewable energy. So greenhouse gas emissions, this was the base case. And the darker line was what would have happened with the CAFE standard going down. And greenhouse gas emissions went down. But after a while, they started going back up a little bit more. And the model also showed that. If the rest of the economy is growing faster, it's consuming more energy. And the marginal source of energy for the rest of the economy was coal, fired electricity. So you can see a lot of the longer things. And so it said this wasn't a perfect solution, but it did help. And there would be other things they'd have to do. So the Millennium Institute works in countries, mostly in countries. We do some work um, at a global level, as I said, with the UNEP report on the green economy and the GEO5 study. To, and the model generates sort of global results. But it's based on pretty broad assumptions because there's no global policy that you can put in. You have to do it country by country. And that's why we're trying to get them to work at the country level. Or we go below the country level. We've done state and regional works in Ohio, uh, in Maui and Hawaii, in uh, Papua and Indonesia, Denmark. And we're working with ECOWAS for a regional group of countries. And we're starting to work with China on a um, city and provincial level work. And one of the interesting things with our China model was showing that to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions by reducing coal, uh, sorry, uh, cement and steel production, we worked with this WWF, that not only did they have to make technical changes, but they could have a major positive impact if they reduced the size of housing that was growing and just have it grow a little less rapidly, because then they'd have to use less cement and steel, because those were the major consumers of cement and steel was housing construction and other building construction. And the model, because it's very integrated, showed that that also increased agricultural production because cities expanded less rapidly into arable land. So taking account of all of these many factors uh, is very useful and gives you some side effects that can be useful in doing uh, and promoting the kinds of policies that you're talking about. So the advantages of the system dynamic approach, which I think are very important to get the message out as broadly as we can, is this based on real world causal relations, not theory or ideological ideas. And it incorporates ex externalities and critical um, <clears throat> environmental and other factors to take account of, and the social relations, I'm almost finished. Um, and it combines the views of experts from many sectors. None of us know everything about everything. But it's a tool that allows various sector specialists to come in and say, you've got to take account of these relations. And then somebody says, and here's another set over here. And by integrating them, you can get a, uh, take account of many of the cross-sector relationships that people don't normally think of, especially when it's not just a direct relation, but five or six steps down the pike to see what things are going on. And we incorporate many detailed sector models into our broad integrated model in order to see what their effects are going to be and have done that quite effectively. So we can include and adapt more things easily and readily because our models are very good at modeling and then they learn from the experts about the special sectors. So we get long-term scenarios which are good. Nobody can make perfect projections. Some people pretend they do, but they don't. But it gives you a rough idea and indicates where things are going and it identifies both negative and positive side effects and finds a way to take advantage of the positive side effects and mitigate or avoid the negative ones. Because there's no perfect policy. Every policy will have positive effects in some areas and not positive effects in others. And you have to balance them out. And we've had many cases, I won't give examples because I'm out of time, where we've been able to balance different points of view to get a more uh, consensus-based program that's better for the country. And it's what I call a transparent common analytic language because when people see how the model works and they feel comfortable that their views have been incorporated into it, then they have a great deal more confidence in the results going beyond their sector. And they say, oh, I didn't think about what was going on in these other sectors. 
But now I see that it's got the key points I think are important in it, and I see what the effects are going to be. So they become more able to cooperate, and we've had that in many countries, and build support for better policies. So my conclusions are basically that we need to have an integrated and comprehensive analysis over the long term. And that's why getting the message of system dynamics and system thinking out is very important. Policymakers need to take a holistic view um, and approach when they work with various stakeholders and not just represent very special interest groups. And we need to get more local people and various stakeholders involved so they can learn about what the effects are going to be and maybe learn why the policy that's not best for them is really best for the whole country and they're willing to make a little bit of sacrifice for the common good. This balance that Cliff was talking about is very important. So I think it's just very, very important to use system thinking to promote the ECHO so can be and make sure that we have sustainable development. So I am finished. I want to thank you very much. We don't have time for questions now. But as I said, in one of the open spaces tomorrow, I hope to be able to give a more detailed introduction to the model and show you how it works because you can actually go on our website and learn much more about what the Millennium Institute does. And you can download several cases of the model. And the user version, anybody can use it and try lots of different policies within the framework that's available. So thank you all very much.